All right, welcome to episode six. Six! Good old six! <laughs> of the Booze Book by Edeker YouTube event, rebranding. Um, with us, you'll notice we have someone foreign to our viewers. But, but not for Pete. Pete! Pete! He's amazing. Welcome, Pete. We'll see. Hello. We're glad to have you. <laughs> Indeed. So this week we read uh, Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke. Josh recommended it. Good call, Josh. It is, yeah. It's, book. it's probably my favorite book of all time. But you didn't so, read it for this. I didn't. I know. I copped out. I was like, ha we only have a week, so I'll do a book I've read a million times. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the 12 steps for this book are actually written in the same flavor an actual 12-step program would be, so it's kind of weird, but that's all right. Weird and good. Yeah. So step one is we admit we are powerless to the overlords. The overlords! Yeah. The dragon people. Uh, you can see that, you know, in the instance of South Africa where they decided to block out the sun um, because they wouldn't get rid of their discriminatory laws. Um, also when that nuke disappeared when they tried to shoot down one of the ships. Um, step two is uh, we come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. Um, so when the overlords showed up, you know, war stopped. Um, everyone got food, shelter. That was nice. Needs. I yeah, like that. That is nice. A positive no, step. A warm, fuzzy part of the book. For some reason, no one wanted more than anyone else. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can tell this is a work of fiction. No, I'm just kidding. From the 50s. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, step three is, um, you know, make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of Supervisor Corellin, as we understand him. Corellin was my favorite character. So. Yeah, he is really good. Yeah. That's a good line. Yep, exactly. Step four, we accept the appearance of the overlords. Fifty years. Fifty years. Had to wait fifty years. I think that was very wise. Yeah, definitely. Only a few people fainted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's one of my favorite parts of the book. Like only a few. Um, step five is we embrace equal rights for all of humankind. Uh, step six, we are protected from the stars through Corellin and the overlords. Um, basically, I jotted down a quote to justify that step, and he says, you know, what if a Stone Age human found himself in a modern city? Um, there's a lot of question, like, well, why did the overlords show up right when we were about to go into space? And that was his justification for it. Um, Wait, say that again? I missed that part of the book. So the direct quote is, what if a Stone Age human found himself in a modern city? Right. So, you know, they'd be lost, confused. They and they call back wrong. They call back to that quote. Doesn't Jan call back to that quote later when he's on their planet? Possibly. Possibly. Was, was this right before they said man was not meant for the stars? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Man yep. is not it's meant kind of for the stars. Only the counter, counter, solar it? system. Yeah, because yeah. man's all like, I want to go to the stars. Yeah. That exactly. sounds cool. Exactly. You've enlightened us, you've brought us peace and harmony or whatever, but... No, you can't go explore. <laughs> yeah, only your own solar system. What's the next step? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so step seven. Even though there is resistance to the overlords, um, we entrust them with guidance. This can be seen, there's a city called New Athens that's kind of seen as kind of res a resistant force. Hippies! Yeah, because they're a bunch of hippies. Making a bunch of hippie babies, doing art things. What was what was the name of the league of the people? Now this is this is before the Freedom they, League. The Freedom League. Yeah. yeah, Joe. Do you guys remember Joe? Oh yeah, the cave. Uh, yeah. yeah, Joe. Yeah. But Joe wasn't wasn't Alpha. Who is Alpha? Uh, I forget that guy's name. Ah, uh, yeah, I forget. We'll come up. I have I have character cards. We'll figure it out later. <laughs> they defined it in a really weird way too. <laughs> There's like some good Welshman or something like weird like that. Like, right, what right, is this? Right. Um, <laughs> so step eight is the overlords are not omnipotent or masters of us, but merely midwives to humanity. Um, step nine, the overlords were sent by the overmind to prevent a telepathic cancer. So basically to guide us. Telepathic in, cancer. Yeah, exactly. No cancer is good cancer. Uh, step 10 is the overlords envy us and our ability to evolve as one consciousness. Um, it's kind of stated in the later halves of the book that Corellin is really envious that the overlords can't do this. They're basically working for the overmind to help other races be consumed by it. It's kind of a dark way to look at it, but... Poor Corellin. I wanted good things for Corellin. I know. 
he lived. Is that not enough? I mean, yeah, that's true. Wasn't he also the only consistent character throughout the entire book? Excellent point, Pete. Yeah. Mm. Excellent point. He was there start to finish. Start to finish. It's very true. It's like Anakin Skywalker in Star Wars. Always. Excellent parallel, Josh. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yes. Um, all six movies. All right, so step 11 is we submit our children to the Overmind. Oh, see, this part made me sad. <laughs> this part made me sad. I stopped reading the book. I just got really busy with work, and I couldn't read, like, the last 15 pages for a right. couple days. And Josh is all like, have you read them? And I'm like, no, this, this book is dark. He's <laughs> like, you can't say that until you read the end of the exactly. book. <laughs> what do you mean? Um, and step 12 is humanity and Earth perish to align with the Overmind. Basically, all those crazy kids um, harness like the energy of the Earth to merge with the Overmind. Is what I got out of it. And in effect, the Earth is gone. In effect, I think the whole dissolving yeah, yeah, thing yeah. kind of covered that. It's just, it's just not there. It's, <laughs> exactly. It seems pretty definitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's the twelve-step program for Childhood's End. Um, that book was intense, man. And there were was. so many mm -hmm. characters because. The, the book lasted throughout so many right. decades. I mean, so how, many, how many years? Was it years total, maybe? That, that yeah. sounds about right. Yeah. So, I mean, there were three parts of the book, right? Mm -hmm. So first is when they first come, yep. and then 50 years later when they reveal themselves. Yep. And then what was that third part of the book called? Because the second one was the Golden Age. Right. I, I forget. forget. With you. So I didn't write down the parts. Jan. Jan Rodericks. He was yeah. in the middle of the book. He was. He yeah. was. Yeah. And the end of the book. And mm -hmm. the end. So that's yeah. good. Yep. Yeah. And that's Gene's brother, right? Who's Gene? Gene. No, Who not Gene. Gene. Gene was the, the one who uh, channeled all mm -hmm. the psychic energy, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. You're yeah. right. Was he married to somebody at that party that everybody No, had? Jan wasn't married to anybody. No, no, no. no. Okay. Yeah. Jan I got that confused because they were at Rupert Boyce's party and he was the brother of the lady. Right, who was married. his brother, who was Jan's, yes. brother, Jan's sister. Who was Jan's sister? Sure. <laughs> Rupert Boyce. I don't who know. Was the, Rupert Boyce this was, is the an super, ancestry was the super vet who was married to Jan Roderick's sister. Yes. Truth. Mm. Truth. Or Dave. Truth. Okay. In no particular order. What do we got? How do you pronounce this, guys? Well, the shortened version was Rashi, because Rupert always called him Rashi, probably because it was so hard to pronounce. Rashi. Rashi, Rashi. And we meet Rashi around the same time we meet Jan, mm -hmm. and Rashi is interested in Rupert Boyce's library of yeah. psychic books. Yeah, like paranormal stuff. Mm -hmm. He's like the nerdiest dragon ever. Well, I would think Rupert's kind of the nerdiest guy ever, because he was there for the 15,000 book collection of paranormal, parapsychology, whatever it was. But That's not true. the nerdiest dragon. Exactly. <laughs> just, just the nerdiest human. Exactly. He's nerdiest human. And Rupert Boyce would not lend out his library. He's like, you can read them, but you have to come here. Exactly. And he's all about drama. He wanted him. He wanted Rashi to come there so he could throw a big party and be like, hey, look at my draconian friend. <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah. Because Rupert Boyce is all about status. He is. And, and animals, because he's a super vet. Okay. How do you pronounce this? Carellin. Yeah. Or Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, basically he was the one um, really talking to humanity and speaking for the overlords in general. He was the he, voice from the very beginning, right? Exactly. When we met somebody whose name is on a card you haven't shown yet, but you know, the only person who could talk <laughs> right. to the overlords was this one person, and it was only to Corella. Exactly. He was like the PR team for the entire overlords. He did a hell of a job. <laughs> yeah. Too. I mean, uh, <laughs> At least that first 50 years. Right. Yeah. Then he kind of got, like, a little emotional. What was the name of that guy? The Finnish... The Finnish guy. Stormgren? Yeah, Stormgren! That was it! That was it! Where's my card? I don't know. I don't have a card. But his name was Stormgren, right? Ricky, Ricky Stormgren. Stormgren. Ricky! Ricky Tiki Tabby. This is what I said in my house, just randomly, all week. Goodbye, Ricky! <laughs> Wasn't that like the best line ever yeah. of the whole book? Okay, whatever. It's like the counterpoint <laughs> to Here's Johnny. 
<laughs> when does he say goodbye, Ricky? Oh, that's right. Ricky was going to like put the flashlight into the glass, right? Mm -hmm. He did very briefly. Right. Mm. <laughs> Corellin was gone. All that plotting. There, there might be something here about the reading of minds or however the overlords yep. uh, just sort of knew everything. Well, and that was the part where it alluded to Ricky had actually seen like what the overlords looked like and chose to keep it to himself. Because he was like, humanity really isn't ready to see that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So did that happen? Because I, in no part of the book did I think that, Ricky, that Ricky had actually seen him. But was it implied? I think so. I think How was it implied? It. I can't remember the exact context. Did you think that he had seen him, Pete? You know, I didn't, but right. now that he says it, I want to say maybe as they flash forward later into Stormbrand's life, when he was like 80, 90, whatever it was, I think there was something there. Yeah, he, might, he might actually be right. Oh, I'm sure he is. He's read it like 10 times. But not in the last week. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the spark notes it says in there. <laughs> oh, yeah, spark notes will throw something wonky in there just to burn the kids who didn't read it. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's not how you teach children. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you guys remember this guy? Alexander yep. Waynes, right? Yeah. He's the uh, leader of the Freedom League. Freedom League! Yeah. Who are the inventors? <laughs> Who are the inventors of Freedom Fries? Oh my god! The aliens are invading our That's house! True. Do you hear it? Why are aliens so clumsy? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. oh. <But> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's talk about Alexander Wayne's right. Now he doesn't show up very for, for very long, but it's kinda neat because he's like the opposition. These overlords are not good news. Yeah, exactly. He and started the Freedom League. Yeah. Because he was like, oh, I don't believe in this World Federation, I believe is what it was called. But the Overminds were trying to make a global government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, he was right. I mean, depending on how you interpret the book. See, I can see how people yeah. are like, oh, well, we evolved and we melded into the Overmind, so mm -hmm. that's great. But I can also see where people are like, yeah, they took away our kids and now we don't have a race. That's true. <laughs> Maybe in the end. All that, all that freedom, but it was so short-lived. Yeah. 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 Okay, Jean Morel, who is later Jean somebody or other. Gregson. Gregson. Say it again? Go for it. Gregson. Yep. Gregson, that's right. That's right. So she is, well, she has some psychic abilities. Yeah. She, yeah. Yeah. I kept thinking of Jean Grey from X-Men. Doesn't Wolverine, doesn't Wolverine like, kill five? her? No. Because she goes crazy and it's like. No. They no. try to bury her in a lake and then she comes back because she's the Phoenix. Okay, but we're not Anyways, talking about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why I thought of Jean Grey is because she is deemed by the Overlords as, you know, the most important human because while they're doing some sort of. I interpret it as like a Ouija board. I don't think they actually said it. But, but it um, was totally a weed yeah, part. Exactly. It was she totally like channeled a bunch of energy through herself. And then later on in the book, her kids are like the kind of precursor to all the children going crazy telekinetic. Yeah. 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 They're like indigo children. What does that mean, indigo children? <laughs> I don't know. That's a new thing. I listen to the indigo girls. Is that similar? No. So indigo children are like, there's aura readers. And like the new aura is indigo, and supposedly they're more in tune with nature and stuff. This happened in the 1980s. Anyways, so, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I like it. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about Vin Darton. Can I say that? Vin Darton? Yeah. Okay. I like him, right? He's going to have a lot of patience. And why does he have to have a lot of patience? Go Pete. Because he has to explain everything to Jan Roderick. As they're on the planet, his exactly. name we apparently don't know, but uh, you know, Chan stows away and he's on this ship and he winds up at this planet. <laughs> Finn Darton's like his tour guide, yeah, you know, just showing him yeah. everything, and it's kind of creepy actually. But some of the things that we're seeing, kind of how is yeah. it creepy? How is it creepy? The mountain that moved. I didn't yeah. understand the mountain that moved. That was something to do with the Overmind, right? Something. Yeah. yeah. Because they were like, we're not going to talk about the mountain that moved. You didn't see it. Right, exactly. Right. It was all hush-hush. <laughs> mountains don't move. You're crazy. 
<laughs> but then later in the book, we see the pillar yeah. of light, and Jan's all like, that's just like the mountain that moved. Exactly. Overmind. Overmind written all over this. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, I found it. Oh, there's Ricky. Oh. Goodbye, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite line. This is my favorite line. Goodbye, Ricky. I'm glad that that's how you read it. <laughs> well, there was so much like suspense built up. Like, can we see what these overlords right. really look like? And then, you know, just kind of like, as you said it right there, as you pronounce, not pronounce, but, you know, all the energy, goodbye, Ricky, as, as the person who Ricky has been trying to see for so long just mm -hmm. sort of sneaks out the back. And so, you know, all that suspense and then just a sort of humorous, say it again. Goodbye, Ricky! <laughs> yeah, that's a hell of a transition. You know? <laughs> okay, the overmind. I mean, this is where it's all about. Right here, kids, this is what it's all about. This book is about the overmind. Yeah. It is. Who wants to expand upon the overmind? Pete? I, ooh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, you chose that card. This is like, if, if, for Star Wars fans out there, this is like the Force. Or it's like the Borg. <gasps> the Force versus it. the Borg. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, it was half Force, half Borg. It was. Yeah. Right? But I think you get the sense, like they say the Overmind is um, trying to expand and like awaken the universe. So that's a good thing. I interpret that as a good thing. Except for like the dissolving of the Earth. Like, okay, it's not like he's striking the universe, but we're we're like <laughs> destroying planets in the process. That's true. But maybe we already destroyed Earth. <gasps> Ooh, or we just know. Deep thought. <laughs> yeah, all our fossil fuels were about to run out anyways. It's useless. This is where you start talking about peak oil. Yeah, or... exactly. Mm -hmm. Wait, no, did the Overlords provide fuel? No, no, I just made that up. Oh. I'm trying to justify um, melding with the overmind. Melding. You know what I mean? Right. Well, it's an. It, why justify the ineffable? I suppose. All right, George. <laughs> George was Jean's uh, partner in crime, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Also known as husband. Later. <laughs> Did you guys think it was really weird that, like, they spent a whole paragraph on how he was diddling somebody else, but he wasn't going to mention it to Jean? It just seemed like they didn't need to even... Well, that one they never follow up on. It. Exactly! Exactly! It, it just seems so irrelevant. It was building character. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's so irrelevant. Goes straight to the mindset of George later on. We never meet this other woman, oh. and Jean and George die next to each other. So, what was the point? What was the point? I don't know. It seemed weird. Arthur C. Clarke is lonely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so George George provides the sperm for the children who get sucked up into the overmind. All of the children. No, two, two, I'm yeah. sorry, two. Two of the children. <laughs> yeah, like... You no, know, for the first children. Exactly. Mm -hmm. For the first children. Jean and George, yeah. 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 Yep. What did I say? It's like Jennifer... No, you said George, but I guess you said the sperm, so yeah, that would be George's half of that contribution. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, so they have the kids Jennifer and Jeffrey, I believe. Yep, Jeffrey and Jennifer, absolutely. And Jennifer is also known as the puppet. That's true. That's <laughs> <laughs> the British habit. The puppet. <laughs> okay, Professor Sullivan. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor Sullivan was key. He was totally key because without Professor Sullivan, Jan could not have gotten into the stuffed whale and would have never made it to the Overlord's home planet. I think the Professor title's a little overrated there. Because, I mean, really all Professor Sullivan did, as far as I could tell, was stuff large animals and ship them off to the, the Overlord's <laughs> home world. Like, he was a taxidermist. He's a glorified <laughs> taxidermist. That is true. But if he hadn't been a professor, he wouldn't have been under the sea. And if he hadn't been under the sea, they couldn't have had their private conversation from the overlords. Very true. Oh, that yeah. True. They know, Everybody thinks nobody can be heard of their underwater and deep caves. And so he was an right. undersea taxidermist. An undersea taxidermist. I mean, that's got to uh, be the height of taxidermy, though. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> If I had to guess, I don't know. 
<laughs> okay, who do we got? Rupert Boyce. We talked a little bit about Rupert yep. Boyce. He was the super vet. But we should talk about the hologram, because I didn't understand it, so go. Yeah, I mean, basically he had a hologram. Well, he was called a super veterinarian because he was studying animals and taking data on them, but he could use this hologram to, like, go out into the world, view these animals in their natural habitat, and, like, interact with them, mm -hmm. instead of actually having to go himself. So, it allowed him to do more work. It's basically what I got from it. I thought he did it sometimes go himself, though. He I did. thought I saw, like, the, it, was, it was to help the animals get accustomed. So, you know, so the lion doesn't maul him when he first meets oh. the lion. Did I, maybe I missed one No, that. that's how I interpret no, it. So he spent a lot of time just warming him up and, you know, cuddling or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Testing the waters before you put yourself out there. I loved it how the overlords were all like, well, yeah, he'll die eventually, but he seems to be enjoying this tool for now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so somebody, somebody throw out a hard question. We will call this a field sobriety test. Ooh. Was after their like mandatory PhD or whatever right. it was, like they, they right. went to college. And, <laughs> I think it was about this nor normal age for us these days. And then they worked for what it was like three years, mm -hmm. and then they went back to school for like another five or three or something like that. Yeah, it was all about education. Mm -hmm. And really, the overlords were just kind of placating the humans yeah. because they knew their end was in sight, so might as well make this pleasant. Or There's beginning. no point for them, anyways. Mm -hmm. Wait, what did you say? I said, or beginning. <laughs> Depending on how old you are. I think there was a point, though. <laughs> That's a good point. They chose to off themselves. They didn't have to. Wait, who chose to off themselves? The people in New Athens that were just like, let's nuke the island. Right, once their children got taken away from them. Oh, right. Oh, we should talk about Jeffrey and how that boulder just disappeared. Yeah, and the tsunami. Dude, if the sea ever just goes away, one thing this book taught me, do not go out there. That's that like, that, like hit that was my, didn't tell you that? That was my <laughs> takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> when the water retreats, it's not whoever that religious figure was clearing a path. It was it's an earthquake. Right. Just just get out of there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's making for a pretty good wave. Just get out of there. So the overmind, not the overmind, the overlords, because mm -hmm. the overmind controls the overlords who are the midwives to the human race, right? Yep. I got that right? So the overlords like had this, this telepathic connection with Jeffrey Gregson, the boy. Right. How did they do that? Is it because they're aliens? <clears throat> I guess that's the answer, because they're aliens. Was it telepathy, or was it just the fact they were kind of creeping around him because they knew he and his sister, the Poppet, were like key to this? Were, were they just watching him, or was it telepathy? Because it was like, um, get out of there, Jeffrey. Just run as fast well, as you can. Oh, yeah. But yeah. they talked to Ricky in the cave as well. They did? Mm hmm. I'm pretty sure. No, the, the, mm. the orbs did. Oh, yeah. It just was had the to orbs. follow the orbs. All right, you're right, you're right. Mm. Yeah, that was an actual physical thing. Yeah. It wasn't just like a, a, a voice in your head. Right. Yeah. yeah I so, think it was telepathy because, I mean, when, what's his name? Rashi. Rashi. Was Rashi, in, Rashi uh, the library. Whatever, he was, yeah. you know, studying paranormal stuff, including, like, telepathy. Mm -hmm. And so, I think, I don't know. I lost my turn of thought there. That's okay. <laughs> it was a great book. No, seriously, good call on this book. I yeah, really enjoyed it. Really, it. I don't think I've read a sci fi book before. I watch sci-fi movies, but I've never read a book. This was good. Really? Yeah, when I went to the library, because I'm so used to going to fiction or nonfiction, and I was like, this book is in sci-fi. That's a section? So, yeah, I found it. Thank you for introducing me to a new part of the library. <laughs> right. That's the best part of the library. Where Cheeto Dust is covering all the books. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but it is telepathy. It has to be, because, like, at the end, all the kids can, like, communicate with each other, and they start, like, spinning the moon. Right. Which, by the way, would destroy the tides. I don't get that. But anyways. Well, the Earth wasn't mm -hmm. around for much longer after well, that. Well, that's true. It didn't matter. I <laughs> <laughs> but I think because it was Jean's offspring, like, she, whatever she had in her grew stronger. 
through her jeans. I don't know why. Jeans, but jeans? Jeans, jeans. Okay. So she was the one channeling all the power when they were Ouija boarding. Mm -hmm. Ooh, did we talk about how they knew knew she was like the one? Oh, not really. We didn't touch on that. I don't think the book. I think I just said like, the... they said she was the most important human. Yeah. Well, the most important human. Did we, did we talk about that though? Okay, so very, very so they do the Ouija board thing, and Jan, just for no reason whatsoever, says, "Hey, what's the son of the Overlord's planets?" Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the the Ouija board says what it is, and then Jean faints. Exactly. And that's it. Apparently, that's how they discover she's the most important person. Yeah, it didn't really make sense. I mean, is that enough? <laughs> I don't know. I think she fainted because she like channeled all that energy to give him the answers to those questions. And then she was like, oh, that's taxing. <laughs> <laughs> and then she fainted. <laughs> that's what I interpreted. <laughs> but yeah. Alright. So should we go over the last section, The Hangover? The hangover. Lasting effects of the book? Yeah, lasting effects of the book for me were me walking through the house saying to anybody who would listen, Goodbye, Ricky! <laughs> How about for you? For me? Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's going to be good, kids. <laughs> no, it's not, because everyone thinks I'm insane when I talk about this. <laughs> Probably because I'm on the bus rambling to myself. But anyway. <laughs> No, it always reminds me of uh, this thing I read when I was in college by Carl Jung, where he was like, there's three steps of evol evolution in the human race. The first is was 44 plus 2 chromosomes, where everyone was unified and like more nomadic. And now we're in 44, wait, how many chromosomes do we have? Uh, 48, right? 46 plus 2. Do we have 48 chromosomes? I thought we had 20 something. What? Times 2. Oh, times yeah. 2. But what is that? We know it's an even number. But Anyways. <laughs> and it's a number. The numbers it's don't. Two. That means it's even, kids. The numbers don't count. Unless what? You're multiplying has decimals. Yeah. <laughs> all numbers only. <laughs> what about imaginary numbers? Like the square root of negative 49. Ah! Seven I. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> but um, basically, I always think this is like Jungian theory for humanity's evolution because he says like we're in the state we're in step two which leads to step three which is unified again and we all every person would be like a cell in a global consciousness essentially and now we're all disheveled and bummed out making art <laughs> <laughs> what was your hangover people um i don't know i was kind of bummed by the fact that this whole utopian society just lingering that you know oh we're not going to take any risks and we're not going to advance because I watched a lot of Star Trek The Next Generation growing up as a kid and this me is like... Too, me too! So did you also feel this was like the opposite? Like, you know, totally. Star Trek The Next Generation, it was a utopia. It was, you know, people died here and there, but, you know, the Federation, all the, all the utopian, and here it's eh, you know, we've got what we need. It was it was kind of a downer in that respect, and that's kind of hung with me. Yeah, yeah. that is true. I, know. I know, I kept try. I agree with you, I kept trying to look okay this is great we're evolving we're we're being sucked up into the overmind this is good but deep down i didn't really feel that way i'm like uh oh, they took away our kids and now our planet's gonna blow up how can you really put a positive spin on that you could stop reading about page 160. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true i don't know there was a good hook in there right about there. <laughs> mm. yeah. i just try to focus on that goodbye ricky <laughs> Then I feel happy. There you go. All right. Well, this was a great episode. I'm so glad that you chose this book, Josh. Well, it's a good show. Yeah. So next book is Portrait of Dorian Gray. Yep. Which I hear is good. I don't know. I've never read it. Is it exactly a thousand words? Is it? No. I don't no. Because <laughs> no, the picture is worth a thousand words. It's worth. Yeah, it's way more than that. Oh, I get. I get. I get. It's it. way it more than a, a thousand words. It's way more than a thousand words. No way. The book. Yeah. Yeah. What? What? Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'm thinking pages. <laughs> you guys might need to take some time before you do the next episode. Yeah. Get some reading. Exactly. Mm. 